done this incorrectly, it's not wrapped this correctly, something's wrong with it, the vertex is not correct. So identify why. Okay. Write it down. Sure. Give me my note on the desk. Huh? Give me my note on the desk. I don't get notes on your desk. No, I put it in the desk. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, ready. wrong with that vertex? What's that? You see the Molly's label, the vertex as being negative three halves? shouldn't be here, it should just be right there. Um, so it should be over here, but up to three. Okay. Uh, no, but partly right. So the thing that you're confusing here is that um, you're thinking this, adding of a constant, gives you the vertical shift. Yeah. That's for specifically for something like this, the vertex form. Okay. That's where, where the, the, the parent function, the basic function is x squared. Okay. Then we take x squared, forget about this plus one for a second. If we take x squared and we <coughs> subtract three from it, then all the outputs are just all the same except for we subtract three from all of them. So it shifts everything down three. Right? And then when if we add one inside, that's a horizontal shift. We multiply by two, that's a, um, making it steeper. That's not the case here. Um, that's why we, we spend all that time going through this vertex form. We concentrated on it for quite a while, talking about why this is a vertical shift, why this is a horizontal shift, why this makes it steeper. That's why we looked at all the this input and this output and compared it to this output and this output and this output. Okay. If that doesn't grab you and you're not quite getting that, then uh, with me, we'll, we'll do it one-on-one, uh, -on -one, help you figure that out, or watch the lecture of that, or watch the tutorial video of that. But this, to, to put it the quickest that I can, this isn't in vertex form. This is just standard form. It's in the process of finding the vertex, so we'll just get there. But while I say no, I also say, OK, so the, there's something, um, there's some element of truth in that. And truth is that this vertex is just on the x-axis, and it seems like there should be a y component to it, right? Since we're moving this, plus three tells us that there should be some kind of vertical something, right? 
it won't necessarily be that the vertex is at negative three halves comma three, um, but there, there should be some y component to it. Um, so how do we find that y component? For x, which number do we put in for x? We want to find that y for the vertex. Negative three halves. There it is. The the x part of the vertex is all Molly found, right? The vertex is not just the result of this. We also need the y component, right? So didn't find y. Again, how do we find y? Plus 2x and x is negative 3 halves. Uh, let's go back here. What what did Molly do here? What you know, what is it? Where did this come from? Let's just put these numbers in here. Number with x squared is always a. A is always with x squared. B is always with x, and c is always a constant. So here's our a and b and c. So when we talk about negative b over 2a, we talk about negative this over two times that. Right, so negative b, b is negative six over two times a. A is negative two. So six divided by negative four, positive divided by negative is negative, uh, and we simplify it to three halves, negative three halves. Right. So what does that tell you? Do negative b over 2a, what does it tell you? Why did we do it? The vertex, the whole vertex? Which part? The x part. It gives you the x part of the vertex. Right. So what happens when you speak up? Like, can you say something or go back and forth? Can you so um, the x value of the vertex is found by doing negative b over 2a. Right? But that's only the x, right? What we have here at negative 3 halves is just the x. We need the y. To find the y, we put negative 3 halves into the function. So we can do that here. Show how to correct this for the position. So let's see, negative 2 times negative 3 halves squared minus 6 times negative 3 halves plus Um, what's negative 3 half squared? times 9 fourths, that's what negative 3 half squared is. Negative 6 times 3 halves with 3 here, so that's a 1. So this would be negative 3 times negative 3, which would be plus 9, plus 3. We have 12 minus uh, 9 fourths times negative 2 would be negative 18 fourths, or negative 9 and a half, if you want to simplify that. And it's uh, 24 halves, if you were to turn this into, uh, to, you know, have a common denominator. Minus 9 and a half equals 15 halves. How much is 15 halves? <coughs> So our, our vertex, complete vertex, is negative 3 halves comma 15 halves. <coughs> There's our negative 3 halves 
15 has a seven and a half. That's seven, as you can't tell. It's a little small in a hurry. Okay. So there's the right vertex, the correct vertex. Um, what about this? What, what was Molly doing here? What's the story? Vertex correctly. Uh, at this stage, we only have the vertex. Four points. We don't need more points. Okay. So one reason is maybe at least a couple different whys or answers to that question. Why? Why is because she needs another point, so she's going to plug in something for x to find out another y value, right? Because she has another point to go to. And when she has that point, since since parabolas are symmetrical, she can reflect that point for x. All right. So she plugged in zero and got three, so that's a point zero comma three. Another way to interpret that why question is why zero? Why not something else? Just plug zero in, that goes away. That goes away. We're just left with three. Could have chosen anything. One, uh, three halves, seven sixteenths, whatever you want. Zero turns out to be a pretty simple answer. Okay. So that part was correct. Just finding the vertex was incorrect, but this is a correct point. This is a correct point. Let's say we're Molly, and we get this vertex of negative 3 halves, and we forget about the y part. And we draw our parabola just like this one, like Molly did, this orange one. Look at that function right there. Which coefficient could have told Molly her vertex was incorrect? She got those other two points correct, and she graphs it. Where it has negative sign? Negative where? Beginning. The negative in front of the x squared tells us it should open down. Hers opens up. So that doesn't tell her what the right vertex is, but it does tell us she has the wrong one. So the negative 2 tells us it opens down. That might have uh, pushed Molly to say, well, what's going on here? Something's wrong. Let me figure out what the right vertex is. Okay. Next one, if you have your pencils and paper, Write something down. Omar has graphed this quadratic in vertex form incorrectly. Here's what you do. Again, Omar, with the vertex, vertex intercept, write down what's wrong with that vertex. Right. What the vertex is, or why you think Omar got the vertex that he got. exactly why Omar did this, but probably uh, he got uh, the plus one plus one in parentheses was a uh, shift to the right. Which is 
there's our correct vertex. Should have been right there. Not one, two, but negative one. Negative two. Um, right, so Omar also found this point of zero and negative one. How do you find that? Plug zero in for x, whatever you put in, uh, you do the arithmetic and you find what comes out of this function and it gives you a point. That's what points do. They represent input and output pairs. So we got that point. So then, well, let's see, put zero in for x. So how do you get this point? Copied it over the over the vertex. What was that? Okay, so yeah, vertex, vertex. So where the line of symmetry is, so that's really what we were trying to get over. Is your thing? Is your thing? Yeah. Uh, Kiki, where is your thing? So yeah, he he reflected it over the line of symmetry, which would have been correct if he had the right vertex, but he didn't. The correct vertex is over here, so the reflection should be. question, or the one that in other, other classes, the other two classes, we spent the most time on, and it's really important, and if you, if, if you're fading in and out, paying attention sometimes and not others, I would tune in for this one, okay, for sure. So the question is, why did Beja set x minus 5 equal to 0? Why? Deep thing, deep question. Okay, I should write down something, write down some kind of a response. saying if we let x minus 5 be 0, right? then what's going to happen? What? What did you just say? Uh, if that's 0, then what? The y is going to be 0. The y is going to be 0. How do we know that for sure? I mean, usually we have to like do a little more math than that. We have to plug numbers in for x and figure out y is going to be. How do you know y is going to be 0? Well, because 2 times 0 is 0. Because y will be 0, right? Because if x minus 5 is forced to be 0, then, as Michael said, 2 times 0 is 0. 0 times <coughs> it doesn't really matter what x minus 1 is, right? Whatever x minus 1 turns out to be, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a number that's about to get multiplied by 0, so the answer is going to be 0. Okay? Um, and that is, we're, we're taking advantage of this real convenient way that, the, that this side of the equation is written. It's written as a number times another number times another number and nothing else. No addition, no subtraction. Not like this one. Okay. 
we do have a number times a number, but then we have minus three. So even if this is zero, that doesn't mean that the y is gonna be zero. Right? It doesn't find us a, a x-intercept. So y is going to be zero if x minus five is zero. Knowing that that will come out to be the answer, that just is like the easiest point, or one of the easiest points to find. Because if, we, if this is zero, then, then y is zero, so if we make that into an equation, x minus five equals zero, that's a super easy equation to solve. Right? x minus five equals zero, I have five on both sides, x is five. Um, so why did she set x minus one equals zero? is going to be zero. If x minus one is zero, we'll have zero times x minus five, right? In the scenario where this is zero, this won't necessarily be zero. Whatever it is though, multiply by zero is zero, multiply two by that zero, y again is zero, right? So to find, what are these points called that we're finding by doing this? X intercepts, find x intercepts. why that works is because we are just multiplying these numbers together. There's no addition, no subtraction. Right? We're using, we're taking advantage of, uh, of something called the zero product property. Um, we know y is going to be zero if we multiply by zero. Um, great, so she found those two points, one and five. And so we're on to the next question. Take a, a minute to write down your response to this. Why did they just put three into the function? They put three into the x. in the south, slam in the middle of those two points. Right there in the middle of those two points. Uh, if we wanted to find that out, we could just take five plus one, divide by two, right? Find the average of two numbers, you're gonna find the number right between them. That's what we wanna find. And that's what this is, add two numbers together, divide by two, because there's two numbers. Six divided by two is three. That's why. Uh, so that's a part of why, because three is the line of symmetry. But um, I mean, at this point, she just knows that that the line of symmetry goes right through there. Why would she put three into the function? Right? That's why three, but why into the function? Michael, because she knows the vertex is going to be on that line. So she plugs in that point, and she'll find the vertex. So uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Yes, three. Uh, this line right through this line of symmetry is going to go right through the vertex. Vertex, vertex is a point, all points have an x and a y, so find the y and you plug in x. If you knew y, you could plug it into y and then solve for x, that's a little bit harder. That's kind of what we're going to start talking about today. But there it is, yeah, so we, we just, uh, we already have x-intercepts. We, since they are straight across from each other, we know they must be reflected over the axis of symmetry, which must be right in the middle. 
And uh, on that line of symmetry, our axis of symmetry, we're going to find the vertex. We find, well, we know that it's at x equals 3. To find the y, we put 3 into the function and find the y. Great. Very fortunate to be in here today. Okay. So Hill did not write this function in standard form correctly. Here's his work. Let's figure out what this y is. y is the final step, the one with the arrow. Why is that in here? So I want to uh, just quickly take 13 seconds and write that down. Why is that in here? Uh, these slides that we're looking at with the you know, student work and the responses. If I printed those out, would anybody be interested in having those like as the take home? How many people would be interested in those? Because afterwards you can go and print them off yourself because I post them online. Is there a few people? <coughs> print, out, print out a few or, or try to remember to print out a few and, and have those for you next time. All right. So, why is the final step incorrect for it? We didn't distribute for it all the numbers. We didn't distribute for And I just say didn't distribute for, that, that may be my personal preference, but hey, if you didn't multiply everything by four, you didn't really distribute for it, so the distribution is. <coughs> So if you were to distribute the 4, you would have gotten 4x squared plus 4x minus 24x minus 24. Not very good there. What? Like, what did they do? Like, like what did they do instead of yeah. distributing 4? Yeah. Just multiply the 4 by the x squared. That's all that would happen. Okay. That happens pretty frequently, pretty, pretty commonly. 4 times x squared. Probably you're just moving too fast. And you don't think, I need to distribute this whole thing. I just get 4x to an x squared, 4x squared. That needs to go to everything. Um, right, to, I'm going to try to bait you into a discussion here with this next question. What process did Gill use to combine the two parentheses? What's that? Distribution. Distribution is what I would love to hear everyone say every time I ask something like that. Distribution. Okay. Now, Gil might have been thinking to himself, this helpful little reminder that I've already talked about. I think I've talked about it already. Yeah? Foil. Foil. Right. Now, foil's not bad. It's not wrong. And it won't get you the wrong answer. We get you the right answer. Uh, it will distribute. It will help you distribute correctly. Okay? But only if you have a binomial, right? Bi meaning two, nomial meaning number, right? These are two numbers. A binomial with two terms times another binomial. FOIL will help you multiply everything by everything else correctly by giving you a mnemonic device that helps you remember every pair that needs to be multiplied together. Okay. But what we're really doing is just multiplying every possible pair together. Right? Every term in here gets multiplied by every term here. Right. If you continue to use FOIL on binomials times binomials, it'll keep being correct. It's not incorrect. It's just when we start using mnemonic devices, and I've noticed over the, my years of teaching that that FOIL mnemonic device causes problems later on. Sometimes mnemonic devices are nice, and they don't mess us up, really. I mean, right? uh, how about HOMES, H-O-M-E-S? You know what it's a mnemonic, mnemonic device for? Me, I'm asking you. I don't know. <laughs> what is it? Homes? Homes, H O M E S. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does that ring something? Maybe in a geography class? Mm -hmm. The the Great Lakes. Great Lakes up, you know, in Michigan. Uh, 
uh, Illinois area, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, Superior homes. Okay. Now, the thing about that mnemonic device is that it's, you know, you know what it's for. It's remembering those five specific lakes. People don't usually make the mistake of thinking it helps to remember the names of all the lakes everywhere. Okay, but that's what happens with FOIL. People think, oh, this tells me how to multiply two parentheses together. No, it tells you how to multiply one binomial by another binomial. So if it didn't cause problems, I wouldn't make any a point of talking about it, but it does cause problems. Okay. So what I want us to remember is this distribution. Distribute everything from here into everything here. Okay. Take every possible pair and multiply those pairs together. So the easiest way, and the way that I do it, and I guess the way that I think is easiest because it's the way that they do it, is I start from left to right and then distribute from left to right. So I start with x and distribute it to x. x squared, distribute the x of the negative 6, negative 6x. Six I would distribute x if there were anything else left, but there's not. So I'm done with x. x has been distributed fully. Okay, move on to the next term, 1. 1's going to get distributed. 1's distributed, distributed, there's nothing else to distribute 1 to. It's done. Now, if you think of it that way, think of distributing every term to every other term. And then you draw those little arcs for, for all of those uh, pairings. Um, we'll get everything. And it's a simple left to right <coughs> idea. Okay. And I don't know why we don't just start students off that way. Why do we teach them FOIL? I don't know, but it's in every textbook everywhere. Um, and it just causes confusion later on to a, a large number of That's it about that. That's my little spiel. Okay, so uh, you can see it says find the minimum or maximum value of the function. Mean it did not find the minimum value of this function correctly. So it's worth, given that mean it did find the vertex correctly, which is the correct answer, why is the minimum value incorrect? So write that down. Write something down. Have a response. Lots of different ways you could answer this. the maximum value is based on the 15? Yeah. Okay. Why is that? Because that's what we want. Um, I mean, something about that 15 is useful when we're talking about the minimum and maximum, that's for sure. Yeah. But um, not quite telling us exactly what the value is. But maybe when we know the number, telling us if it's a minimum or a maximum. So I want to draw your attention to this statement right here. That I'd like you to just rock your world and to change you forever. Okay? When we say the value of the function, 
want you to think about a function. What is a function? What is a function? Takes stuff in and puts stuff out. Yes, excellent. A function is like a factory. It takes things in and puts things out. Okay. Um, so we're going to concentrate on that. I don't want to. I don't want to let anybody think that's what a function is solely. There's one more thing we have to say if we want to say the function. What's that special thing that a function does? It does this input-output thing in a specific way. Every input has only one output, exactly one output. Not zero outputs, not two outputs, not three outputs, definitely not three. One, just one. OK. Uh, but the thing we want to concentrate on is this, this factory idea, right? in and out. Things go in and things come out. Right? Uh, well, a lot of these functions, these factories, are the same in that they take in the same number, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, maybe some negative numbers. They all do that. The thing that they do differently is what comes out of the function. So the value, the value of the function is what it puts out. What goes in is kind of uninteresting. Because 25 goes into lots of functions. But not all functions take 25 and turn it into 130. What we're interested in is what does this fun function do with 25. Okay? So the value is the y value. Okay? Um, and, and so much of, of the way questions are worded so much sense can be made of them if we go back to things like, oh, value of the function. OK, so if I want to talk about the value of a function, I'm talking about the output. I'm talking about the y value. If I'm looking at the graph, I'm talking about whatever representation of the output is, that's the value of the function. Right? Um, so the value of the function is the y value for one thing. So uh, Mina put 25. That's the x value. That's the thing that goes into the function that's really uninteresting. The thing that we want to know is what comes out. Okay? So that's the first thing. The first thing is that, hey, the value is the y value, right? So the value of the function is the y, right, the y value. Um, all right, so if, if we knew there was a point where we, we were to find a minimum or a maximum, then uh, we would be interested in the y value. So that's one thing. But we haven't really even addressed it about the vertex. How do we leave the vertex is even a point that we're interested in if we're looking for the maximum or the minimum? What is the vertex? How would you describe the vertex? How would you describe the vertex of a parabola to someone who didn't know what it was? Here's a parabola, or here's a parabola. How would you describe the vertex? Right in the middle? Where it changes directions. Where it changes directions, okay? It's coming down and then it's going up, right where that happens at the, the very bottom or the very top, depending on if it's this way or this way. That's our vertex, where it changes directions. Mm -hmm. Because that describes it for either situation, where it changes directions. Um, okay. Well, then, uh, the, that that very biggest value or that very smallest value must be at the vertex. So I didn't mean to know this was a minimum value and not a maximum value. We don't even have to draw the graph. We don't have to do anything. We can tell by this equation. This is what you were talking about there. Something about this tells us that it's a minimum value, not a maximum value. So how do we deduce that? How do we know it's going up? What about the picture? It's positive. We got a positive in front of the uh, x squared, or the v squared parentheses, right? And when it's in vertex form, that's what tells us whether it opens up or it opens down. It's very steep, right? 15 is, makes it very steep, uh, but it makes it you know, still open up. It does, it's not negative, so it doesn't 
close that open. So if it opens up, and we found the vertex, and the value of the function is the y value, and we know that the smallest y value in this case would be uh, at the vertex, then that value is 130. Okay? So 15 is positive. Is there, is there a, a maximum value for a, for a parabola that opens up? No. Why not? It just keeps going. Just keeps going. We usually put arrows on these to indicate foreverness. So you just keep on going forever. There's no value too big. You can get to any value you want to uh, if a parabola opens up. just watching me do it for that kid every time. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> uh, can I show you that, that video from that guy uh, on YouTube, Derek Tassio? Yeah. And talk about science and trees and all the trees in there like carbon. Of carbon dioxide. Yeah. And he talked about how he makes videos yeah. and how he highlights misconceptions. That's the idea. Now, that, not to toot my own horn or anything, but I've always known that that's a good idea. You've got to, to learn from mistakes. That is the most significant way to learn. Right? If you just happen to luck out and always do it right and never make mistakes, then if, I mean, one thing, if your friend does it wrong, you have no idea how to help them because you don't know why you would do something. <coughs> I don't know. Do it right. Do it right. Right? So I need to be able to help you see what might go wrong and why that's wrong and, and how to do it. Said, I think you ever talked about this, but the people felt like being told what the misconceptions were was more confusing, but then when it actually turns out, their, their test grades were better. Right? They learned, even though they felt like they were more confused. Right? If you feel confused by this, well, you're paying good attention, paying good notes, and, and we are throwing those switches from incorrect to correct. somebody else make mistakes, the same mistakes that you might be making, and like, um, there, there are some things that I try to warn you about, like, hey, watch out for these things, don't make these mistakes, kind of like, uh, if I was teaching you to drive, you know, I, I would warn you of big things, like, watch out, don't run into that other car, right? that's a big thing I would like, but little mistakes like, things that you just kind of get used to, that you have to experience for it to be significant. I can tell you, if I was teaching you how to drive stick, I can tell you uh, when it feels like you're about to stall the engine, right? That'd be a mistake. But you'll never learn just from me showing you, even though I'm doing it and um, I'm, I'm showing you how not to stall the engine and, and showing you uh, what it looks like and what it sounds like. Until you do it and you stall the engine a few times, it does you don't really get it. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Can you drive a manual as well as a drive stick? Not stick. Not what? I haven't driven stick. Oh, you haven't driven stick. Um, anybody who's driven stick knows how to drive stick? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Analogy making sense? No. You have to experience the stall of the engine to know what you're doing wrong. And no amount of me like showing you somebody else doing it wrong. 
experience of having that proven state and then seeing it correctly or correcting yourself to actually fix it. So I would love to be able to just tell you the first time before it's just make absolute crystal clarity and never make mistakes, but mistakes are inevitable. So, um, yeah, I think you tried. there's no more other questions, then we'll just collect homework and Okay, so now we're going to talk about something really important that you may understand, you may not. Okay? Uh, and I'll keep harping at it and, and reiterating this point over and over and over uh, until it seems like everybody's got it and I don't need to repeat it anymore. So we'll see if that ever happens. It hasn't happened before. So this class could be different. Um, where is it? Where is it? Let's see. Where is it? The thing I'm going to harp on here is the word solution. Okay, it's one of those words. Like I, we talked about value of the function, right? And I, I made sure that we talked about it in depth and we find it really clearly. I hope that the value of the function is the y value, the output, that's what's important. Okay, so solution, this word solution is a really important word that we use all the time, but you may still not know the meaning of, okay? So first, let me show you what the solution isn't. There's lots of things people say, and if I say, what's the solution, they give me lots of answers, and none of them are correct, okay? So the function y, x, a coordinate, point, a table, equation, graph. Here's the most common one, the answer. Still wrong, okay? The solution and the answer are not the same thing, okay? And that's a little confusing, because in life, if you have a problem, and you find the answer to that problem, or somebody else says, hey, I found a solution to that problem, you think, well, you found the same thing. There was a problem, and it's fixed, and the answer and the solution is all the same, okay? In math, that's not true, okay? That happens a lot. Uh, I mean, they're not opposites, they're not unrelated, but they're not the exact same thing. Like they are, when we use that word colloquial, <coughs> you know what colloquial means? Nope. Anybody heard of colloquial? No. Colloquial means like common, everyday. So the colloquial use of solution would be the same as saying the answer. But in, in math, the solution is really specific, and the answer is really, it's actually quite broad, right? The answer can be several different things, but the solution to an equation uh, is something really specific. So before we move on, let's make sure we understand what the solution to an equation is. What is this thing? What is the solution to an equation? Anybody gonna have to respond, we're gonna have to get the ball rolling. Um, because you, you get an equation and you solve it, right? You solve it means you get the answer. The solution is a, is a thing, it's actually a thing. It's got an actual definition. Because the answer, depending on what the question is, the answer might not be the solution, it might just be a fix or a remedy or uh, the answer, right? Uh, you know, what color is that? Process. Yeah. Like add two to both sides and yeah. divide by six. Like that process is called the solution? Well, like if you're trying to solve, if you're trying to figure out like what y is, yeah. you have to plug in x. Okay. And like x is the solution. Okay. Um, We're getting there. We're getting there. Let's say that we don't have a y, we just have uh, just an equation with x in it. Now, there are solutions when you have y too. So let's just stick with simple ones where we just have an x. So x is in there and other numbers, and then we do that process and we find x is something. So what, what would you say then? What would you say the solution is in that case? Yeah. We get that. We, we get that. We find say x equals. We, we 
found the solution. Exactly what it is. Okay, so you take so it's it's something that you might say like yeah that's already what I was thinking but you hadn't quite put it in those words. Okay, so the solution to an equation, let's say to a simple equation, where it's just x is the only unknown, and you just sort of find out what x is. Okay, so it's a, a number that you put into okay, you said function. I'll say equation. Um, that makes the equation true. Okay. I say equation because if we said function, then we might be including like an x, y situation like Danica was talking about. And those do have solutions, but they're, they're similar, but a little bit more like involved. Right? But a simple solution, the most simple way that we can talk about a solution is to say there's one variable that we don't know the value of, uh, if we do find the solution to that equation, is the value for that variable that we plug it in, it makes the equation true. Both sides are indeed the same. Um, and we can expand this out to functions, right? So you just have to have two numbers, an x and a y, that when you plug them in, the equation is true. We can expand it out to inequalities, a number that you plug in for the variable that makes it true, right? The, the, the side that's supposed to be bigger is bigger, or the side smaller is smaller. So whatever it is, it makes that statement, whether it be an equation or an inequality or anything else, any other relationship, uh, into a true statement. Okay. So if, if I say solution and you think that, it makes our discussions a lot easier. Okay. If you think, oh, the solution is that number I can plug in and make the equation true, because that's your default definition, it helps out a lot. Okay. It's not just the answer. The answer is, is the solution. When we find the answer to a lot of times what we're doing is finding the solution to the equation. All right, so let's start out with some simple, um, simple equations. And I'll ask you what the solutions are, uh, whether it be one solution or maybe there's multiple solutions. Uh, start out with an easy one, 2x is the solution to this equation. Carl, what's the solution? How do you know? That's how you know. Because if you take two and you put it in, it works. It makes the equation true. Um, how about x squared equals 25? Five. Five. Okay, because why? Five times five is 25. So x is five. Is there only one solution? Are there more yeah. solutions? But x could be negative 5. That's also a, a solution because x squared. Negative 5 times negative 5. Negative 5. Negative 5. Negative 5. Negative 5. Negative 5. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, how about x squared plus 5x uh, equals 0? 0. Pretty much, well, every class so far. Zero there, zero there, it's zero. It's a zero. Okay. Here's the thing, this is a quadratic equation, just like this is a quadratic equation. The fact that it's squared, as well as this is squared, might tell you maybe there's another solution. You feel like there's this thing where you know, this negative multiplies negatives by negatives and this is positive. So maybe there's another way for this to happen. You get zero in another way. Negative five. How do we know that works? How do we know that's a solution? What? Well, that's not um, exactly the block. So you're, um, you're yeah. yeah, and so what Carl's doing, I'm sure what, what everybody's doing, is plugging negative five into the equation, and it's working. We're getting zero equals zero. Right? So negative five to the negative five is 25 
5 times negative 5 is negative 25, so subtracting, uh, or we're adding together opposites to get 0. Now, what we're going to talk about is the process for finding both of those solutions in a way that's, uh, that's like consistent, that we can apply to any kind of quadratic equation, at least a quadratic equation like this one, right, where we have an x squared, which means a 1 in front of the x squared, plus bx, b meaning anything could be times x, plus c, meaning c could be anything. Okay. We're going to find a way to solve these quadratic equations. And it's just, it's unlike a lot of ways that we've tried to solve equations before. Right? You try to get the variables on one side and the numbers on the other side, and then you do something from there. Okay? The idea here is a, a, is a different. Okay. Um, you might try things like divide by 5, divide by x, or uh, any number of things that turn out not to work out so hot. But what we can do, if we go all the way back here to the quiz, and we look at this problem, we say, why did, why did they just set x minus 5 equal to 0? Right? Because y would be 0 if that happened. Right? Because if we multiply something by 0, we get 0. Right? We all agreed on that? If you multiply something by 0, the answer is 0? OK. So the idea here is to really, like, I like to tell myself stories, like to make up stories about the, the history of math, which probably, like, 99% of them are, would be false. But uh, you know, one day some guy was trying to solve some quadratic and he was trying to divide by five, it wasn't working, divide by x, that wasn't working. Uh, it just wasn't working. And then all of a sudden he had this idea that if he were to get it to be equal to zero and then write it as something times something else like this, I'm just gonna rewrite it like this, x times x plus five. Can I rewrite this this way? Is it the same thing? Yeah. How do you know? Distribute the x in there, and you get x squared plus 5x. Okay, So these are equivalent. They're the same thing. But here's the clever part. This guy said to himself, now these are multiplied together, and the answer is 0. Very important that the answer is 0. Because right? if you multiply two things together and you get 0, what could you say about these things? Or one of these things? Multiply two numbers together and get 0. What's 0? One of the numbers, this one or this one, right? Well, one of the numbers is just x. So if x is 0, we get whatever times 0 is 0. If this other number, x plus 5, is 0, then whatever this is times 0, we'll give that 0. So now what's the clever thing about it is it's taken this rather difficult equation, and they, they just get more difficult from here. Uh, it's turned it into a product, and we're taking advantage of something called the zero product property. Zero product property says something that we've, we've already said just now. Zero product property. Okay. Product, because we're multiplying things together. Zero, because we're getting zero. If we multiply two numbers together <coughs> and we get zero, then it's a guarantee that either A is zero or B is zero. There's no other way for that to work. Now, it doesn't work for a times b equals 1 or a times b equals 13. It works for 0. If you multiply two numbers together to get 0, we know one of them has to be 0. There's no way to multiply two things that are not 0 and get 0. You've got to multiply by 0 to get 0. Okay. So that's the clever thing. And now if we solve this very simple equation, x plus 5 equals 0, we get x equals negative 5. That was a lot easier. So we break it down into a product. We use the zero product property saying one of those has to be and then we can make two really easy equations to solve. Okay. So the the challenge of it is, what if what if it's not that easy? What if it's not x squared plus five or x squared or x squared plus five x or x squared plus two x or something real nice and easy like that? Then what do we do? So it comes down to what's called factoring. Um, what is a factor? One of those words you can't never be sure you define correctly. What is a factor? How, why is one thing a factor of another thing? Can you multiply? What's that? Can it be multiplied? Can it be multiplied? To 
3 is a factor of 15 because 3 is going to be multiplied by 5 to get 15. Right? So we break 15 into factors, 3 and 5, because 3 times 5 is 15. So if we back up here, x squared plus 5x, that's a number, just like 15 is <coughs> a number. And we can factor it into two numbers, right? this number times that number, the factors of that quadratic expression. Now let's try and generalize for any situation that looks like this. 1 times x squared plus something else times x plus something else. Right? How are we going to factor that? So you're going to notice a, a pattern that, that comes about and uh, take advantage of it. So 4.3, uh, sorry, number 3. And uh, what happened there? So x squared plus 6x plus 5. So we're going to work on factors. We're going to learn how to factor the simplest of polynomials. The simplest of quadratics. So we've talked about this. Why? What makes a factor a factor? Because it's going to get multiplied by another factor. Right? So what we're going to have is something times something else. Are you just going to tell me how to factor it? Yeah. I don't want to. I'm going to go into it. So let's break it down piece by piece. Okay. What's going to happen here is this is going to get multiplied by this. Well, here's, there's two uh, terms here that make the, the factoring process pretty simple. The x squared and the constant. You're going to multiply these together. What's the only two things you can multiply together to get x squared? X times another x. So we know there needs to be an x in this factor and an x in this factor so that when we multiply them together, we get x. I mean, you could have uh, x squared over here and, uh, and just a number over here, like 1, but then we haven't really been clever, right? So that we get two simple expressions, and if we set each of them equal to 0, it's easier to solve. So we make this is an x and this is an x. So we get x times x times x squared. Okay, then somehow in this process of multiplying these together, we're going to wind up getting just a number, a constant number, right? With no x's, just a number. So it's the only way you can. The only things you can multiply together and get just a number by itself. Numbers. 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 You can only multiply numbers together to get numbers. Right? If one of those numbers is attached to a variable, now we've got variables involved. So the only way to get a number is to multiply two numbers constants, right? Constant numbers. So we know that two numbers need to get multiplied together to make five. Okay, so now we're thinking, how do we multiply together to make five? <coughs> Five, that's convenient, it's the only way that it can happen. One times five. Right. Well, that, that gave us a lot of information. We know we need an x times an x to get x squared. We know we need something times something else to get five, and five happens to be convenient because it's five. It can only be factored one way, one times five. Okay. Well, we can't be s certain that we're correct yet. How can we be certain that we're correct? What's, uh, okay, so you're saying if you multiply together, you find out that you don't get that. Yeah. Okay, so let's multiply it together, right? Not foil. Right? You used to go out foil. We're going to distribute from one parenthesis into the other. You get x squared. What do we get there? 5x. Plus 5x. Plus 1x. Plus x. Plus 5. We did get 6x. Two and three would multiply to six and add to five, so that would be for something else. All right. So all, all we want to maybe see is that this is the same as that. Okay? Who feels comfortable just if I gave you this verifying by multiplying together that it's the same as that? Can you do that? Yes. Yeah? So if we, if we give those two factors, you can multiply them together to get 
that thing right there. Who feels comfortable going from here to there, factoring it out? Mm -hmm. If they're all that easy, yeah. If they're all that easy, then yeah. Okay, so what process, what does that look like? How are you going to factor that out? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll give you another one if you try it and see how it works. X squared plus um, uh, 7x plus 10. Possibility number one. Here in orange, possibility number two. Okay. And then we're coming up, the way we're coming up with these is just using x squared and 10. Like those are the most obvious ones. The only way you can get x squared is x times x. That's for sure. Okay. And the only way we're going to get 10 is two numbers multiplied together that make 10, that's factors of 10. So what are two factors that Multiply it together to make 10. Two and five. How about some other factors? One and ten. One and ten. So that's another possibility based on the information we've looked at so far. But only one of them could be right. In fact, whenever you, you factor a quadratic or any polynomial, if you don't know what a polynomial is, we'll talk about it later, but uh, they look a lot like this. They're just like more complicated versions of this. Um, there's only one way to factor it. There is a unique factorization. Um, once you get it down to things that can't be factored anymore. Um, so based on uh, uh, the information we've used so far, that we need to get an x squared and a 10, like either one of these will work, except for how do we verify the one that does actually work? Michael? Well, you gotta distribute it. You gotta distribute it. You gotta distribute this into there, right? And so the correct one, well, these are both going to get x squared and 10, but the correct one will also get what? 7x. 7 7x. Okay. How can we tell just right here, right now, which one of these is going to add up to make 7? Just number one. Yeah, 5 and 2, right? Because x is getting multiplied by 5, and 2 is going to get multiplied by x. There's our two like terms, our two x terms that are going to get added together. x squared, right there, uh, plus 5x plus 2x plus 10. x squared plus 7x plus 10. This one also gets x squared and 10, but it gets us x squared plus 11x plus 10. And that's not right. So not only do these, mul these numbers need to multiply to make 10, they need to add together to make this coefficient of x. Because they're going to wind up being, uh, they're going to be the coefficients of the like terms. Do one more, like that, and then I'll remind you why we're doing this. Is this our assignment? Uh, like this kind of stuff? Yeah. Good. I always just pay attention to that. Right. So one last one, back to that one. Um, okay, because 18 can be factored multiple ways. Also, there's negatives involved. It's just rich.
ratio of x to other numbers in the area. So it's probably not. Yeah. 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 We know that it's going to look something like this, that q plus something and q plus something else. The plus might be a, of a negative if I don't do that. Anymore. But what we know is that we're going to multiply these two numbers together and get, and get what? Negative. Negative. Negative 18. Negative and we're going to add them together and get? Negative 10. Okay, so first of all, what's the only way to multiply and get a negative? Uh, positive times negative. Positive times negative. Negative times positive. So one of them has to be negative, and one of them has to be positive. All right. So we can write that down. We know that for sure. That's a guarantee. No way that's not true. It's nice to be able to write things down that you know you don't have to omit. Um, so we know we're going to multiply to 18, so we need to think of the factors of 18. So we got 6 and 3. Uh, we got 9 and 2. We got 18 and 1. Right. So keep it in mind that we, we also need to add together and make a negative. So no matter what combination we use, what can we say about the negative number? It's got to be bigger. It's got to be bigger, right? Yeah, it's got to be bigger. We're going to put the bigger value with the negative. Because when we add those two together, it needs to come out negative. OK, so think of two numbers that have a difference of 7, because we're going to subtract them. 9 and, and 2. Seven. Nine, 9 and 2. And two. Not 6 and 3, that has a difference of 3. Nine. Not 18 and 1, that has a difference of 17. 9 and 2. Nine and two. Nine negative and two. 9, positive two. And then we can multiply it together if we want to, and you know, write it all down and verify that it worked. But just, we can imagine that we do that. Q squared, uh, negative 18, we got our Q squared by constant. And then negative 9Q plus 2Q is going to be negative 17. Okay, so why we're doing this step, Michael? Um, I remember like one of my la math classes last year, the year before, when we were doing this, uh -huh. we'd write down like all the factors uh -huh. of them or whatever, and then like, Add or subtract them and see if the middle number, like which one got the middle number, right? Instead of putting it into that form, and then we do the one that was right and put it into that form. Okay, that I mean we did that essentially by I listed them all off, right? We did nine and two and six and three and one and eighteen. We just kind of did it mentally. But I mean, do whatever uh, helps you keep track of that stuff uh, best. Um, I mean, if we were really going to list them all out, we'd have to go. Uh, negative 9 and positive 2, negative 2 and positive 9, negative 6 and positive 3, you know what I'm saying, or like switch the negative 2. But we might be able to skip over that if we choose. This is a quadratic equation. This is a quadratic equation. Well, this isn't. This is an expression. So you see, why is this not an equation? I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about this this expression. It's just this expression. We're practicing factoring right now. Okay. Let me remind you why we're learning to factor. Okay. It's to solve equations. Okay. So let's look at an equation. Like uh, 32. So before we need to like think about solving it, let's cover up the zero. I'll just go ahead and factor this quadratic. If you don't know why we're doing that exactly, it'll become clear here in the next step. So let's just go ahead and factor it. I'll factor it at the same time.
would let you just kind of play around with this for a minute and ask lots of questions and say lots of things, but we're running low on time. So I'm just going to say real quick. We know that we have to multiply to make a positive and add to make a negative. The only way to multiply to make a positive is positive to positive or negative to negative. And so we need to add these together to make a negative. I know it's negative and negative, so I haven't written those down. And then just went through all the factors that would add up to 16, right? Because they're both negative, so they're going to go in the same direction on the number line. So negative 16. So again, I, we've already talked about this, but again, I'm going to restate it here at the end. Why we're doing this, why we're learning the factor, is because we're being really clever. We're taking this equation, which seems very, very difficult to solve using traditional methods. Like, we might try to subtract 48 from both sides, and then usually people get stuck right there. Subtract 48, I don't know what to do from there. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage that it's equal to zero, then we write it as one number times another. And what do we say about one number times another number equals zero? What's the guarantee? Zero. One of these is zero. Yeah. One of these has to be zero. This is a number times a number. We get zero. So either this has to be zero. If that's not zero, then this has to be zero. So or this has to be zero. It has to be. It has to be one of those. Okay. So these are the only, this, the only two values of w are the ones that will make these equations. Make this equal zero, make this equal zero. We made two easier equations to solve. W's 12, W's 4. There's only one way to factor this. We found it. There's only one way that these can multiply to make zero if one of these is zero. We solve those simpler equations. Right? Really, it's, it's not just another thing to do. It's like an experience in, in being really clever. Uh, having a really good idea. Set it equal to zero, factor it, now one of those factors has to be zero.